you are taking notes, uh, if you are taking notes in your Bible, and I do recommend having a Bible that you could take notes in. I haven't mentioned this in quite a while, so I'll talk about it just for a moment because I saved us so much time earlier on announcements that we're really we've, we've got a uh, we've got a surplus right now of preaching time, so I'm not worried about taking a little bit of extra. Uh, you may have noticed that these are the Bibles that I tend to use, and uh, I just want to put a plug in for it because I haven't in quite a while. But this, this, but the Bibles that I use are um, printed by a church, local church publishers, and they are in that town in Michigan. I always forget. Is it Grand Rapids or where are those where are those people at? Let's see here. Uh, Lansing. Is it Lansing? Yeah, Lansing. I think it is Lansing. Anyway. Uh, they, they're, they're beautiful Bibles, but the great thing about them, they, they have a lot of different ones. Actually, now you can order it. If you're into the Schofield Bible, they, they have the originals reprinted, and, and uh, they also have uh, Thompson Chain uh, that, that's available now. And I do recommend I, uh, for people that study the Scripture, and uh, if you don't take neat notes or if you'd like to look at cross-references a lot of times, I've been helped a lot of times by Thompson Chain editions, but they print King James versions of the scripture only and it's a local church that does it not a publishing house and they don't make a penny on the bible and i appreciate that first of all that it is a ministry not a for-profit business printing the scripture i don't want a for-profit printing the bible i'm just not i'm not okay with that i'm not comfortable with that and they're beautifully done leather this one here would be full grain morocco this high and i abuse my bible something terrible uh, and uh, they're, they're just tough, very well made. I've never had one rip or tear out. Matter of fact, I've got this Bible here, which is the same Bible. Uh, this one is, I hate to say it, it's, it's aging out. Uh, I've had this one since two, 2001 at my ordination. I was given this one by a pastor. And uh, I've, been, I've used them both for a lot of years. They're excellent. If you're interested in one that you could take notes in that would have really no commentary in it but just wide margins that you could take notes in, I accidentally ordered a beautiful large print version. And because my eyes are in such excellent condition, I don't have any need for large print. Matter of fact, it's a little obnoxious to me to have to cover so much territory uh, in order just to read a word. You know, I want to I get a lot of words. You know, it's too much real estate, it's wasted space. And it wears my fingers out turning pages so often when you don't have enough print on it. So I do have a really nice one. A Bible of this quality, these are not, this is not, um, what do they call fake leather? Bonded. Synthetic. Bonded leather. It's called PU, polyurethane. Yeah, they, but they even have like ground up leather glued back together. Fine. Well, that sounds like a, uh, like a song you could sing, ground up leather glued back together. That'd make a great country song, wouldn't it? All right. But uh, bonded leather is kind of like ground up leather glued back together. Well, that sounds catchy, doesn't it? I'm going to write a song after church about ground up leather glued back together. All right. Uh, you're in Revelation chapter 12. Uh, I've got a beautiful one at home. Gorgeous Bible, brand new condition. Uh, hardly, I, I, I preached out of it one time because I couldn't find my Bible. And so, if you're interested in it, I think I paid $65 for it. And it would be about $300-something in a bookstore for the equivalent quality Bible. So it's a real bargain. That church sells them at cost. So, if your eyes are failing, mine aren't, but if yours are failing, uh, and you can hardly see, I've got a large print, high quality Bible. Or perhaps you know someone that won't admit that their vision has gone and uh, you could help them with the same. So, there you have it. All right, so I used up my announcement time. Let's go to Revelation. Give it to my mother. My mother uses the Bible that she had about... Mom's Bible is 40-something years old. Now, she won't give it up. She's had it rebound and so forth. I've tried to buy her a Bible before, and it won't work. So I tried to buy Melissa a Bible. I finally did it. I bought her one. Do you have your new Bible, baby? <laughs> yeah, she, she has a beautiful Bible I bought her. And it, it's really nice. She won't use it because it's not her Bible. So. I would give it to a family member. How about my little brother? How's your eyesight? 
He's, he's aged a little more than I have, hasn't he? Maybe he needs it. Well, we'll talk about it tonight. Revelation 12. <laughs> Verse 12 of Revelation 12. Therefore, rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea! For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask that you would help us with understanding the Scripture this evening. Help us as we just simply are introduced to Israel now and as we begin to uh, see the things that Israel will endure as you are purifying her and preparing her, Lord, to be what she's always been supposed to be. We just thank you for what we'll we learn tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Understand and know that at this time that we come to the place, this place in Revelation, that we're not talking about the church anymore. There are no analogies that uh, that carry similarities with the church. We are at a place when we are looking at this this woman, this woman who is developing or being prepared to have a man child. Now, uh, in verse five of Revelation twelve, we see this woman. The Bible says she brought forth a man-child which was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. So now I want us to understand our time frame as we're talking in Revelation 12. When John is being used by the Holy Spirit to write the Revelation, had Christ come or was that a future event still? This is not a complicated question. Is that a past event that had happened or was it a future event? Did I ask this a really complicated question? The first time that Christ came to be born. Had Christ come? He hadn't come before then. Okay, so had Christ come? Yes. Okay, so when this woman who is the nation of Israel gave birth or travailed in birth with a child, that child was Jesus Christ. So when we're looking at time frame here in the this introduction, are we talking about a future Israel or are we talking about Israel, Jacob, or Israel of the past? Do you understand what I'm talking about, the point of reference? In other words, we have to be careful to understand our chronology as we look at these events to understand what time frame we're speaking of. Up to this point, we haven't really been introduced to Israel in Revelation. Israel has not been addressed. The church has been addressed in the first right, right away in the beginning. And now, the, for several, for a portion of Revelation, the first three and a half years of the tribulation, we have looked at wicked mankind, at the world. Now we're going back, and we are sort of giving the origins. Uh, I'm not a good movie person, uh, so I, you know, I don't write movies, and, I, and I'll be honest with you, uh, as far as video and so forth goes, if it's not poorly done, it's probably not that interesting to me. And if it's very well done, I don't notice. Uh, so I, I just have to be honest with you. When it comes to movies, the worse they are, the more that I can appreciate them. Let me give you a for instance. Some years ago, and I don't know if this is controversial or not, but some years ago, somehow, I think it was your brother David got the movie Hercules, uh, I think, when, when we were in Pensacola. And it was David and Chris and Melissa and I tried to watch this movie Hercules, and Arnold Schwarzenegger played Hercules in it. And it was absolutely the worst film you've ever seen. 
you got Arnold Schwarzenegger who can barely speak English playing the part of an English speaking character and he's Hercules and it was just awkward 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 it begins with I think Zeus throwing a lightning bolt which was plainly made out of rebar bent into the shape of lightning and painted white and I lost it at that point you know when he <laughs> threw the piece of rebar which is supposed to be a lightning bolt I just thought this is a low budget film and that's one of the places where Arnold Schwarzenegger I'll be honest with you I don't remember the plot of the movie how it ended or anything but I would probably watch it again just because it was so terrible <laughs> so I have an appreciation for terribly done film uh, Taj and Tony when they watch a movie see things that I don't see they'll be like oh this is, this is filmed in so many frames you know is it 24 frames that's common or 36 frames or whatever it is anyway they know they know about editing. Taj will tell you, oh, it wasn't done right. That shot's not right. This isn't done right. If you've ever seen uh, something Taj has edited, you know. I mean, the guy knows what things should look like because they look really good. You don't notice what's going on because it, the transitions are, you know, not they're done appropriately, you know, and so forth. So um, I'll say that just to qualify is that I can't explain, you know, the types of plots and so forth. But I do know this. A lot of times when you're, when you, start when a, when a show or a play or a movie starts, you see a couple of characters and you're introduced to a conversation or a dialogue between the main characters of the event. And then a lot of times they have like, a, I don't know what you call it, I call it a flashback to the past, you know, and you see, you know, the, the main character as a child in some event, you know, maybe a couple of the main characters having a conversation and they're, uh, they're going back to the places, uh, to that place when in their childhood that maybe formed who they are or shaped the events that matter today. So in Revelation, if you want to kind of use that analogy or understanding, we're introduced to Israel. And it isn't as though Israel is new on the scenes of time. Israel has been in existence for thousands of years. But Israel has not been in God's scheme of events, or God has not been working through Israel. I like the way that Hebrews puts it, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke to us. In other words, God at different times used different, that it was what we would call a dispensation, worked through the world in a different way. And God used to work through Israel, uh, and He used Israel to give us His Son, but on Israel's turning from Jesus, God has set her aside for a while, is now today working through the church, but God will one day again work through Israel. And so what we see in the half point or the midpoint of the tribulation period, the three and a half years that we've seen pass, what we see at this point is we are again introduced to Israel and God is going to start working with her again. And we see what is happening in the future events for Israel. This harkens or this brings me back to the time when Abraham, you know, when God made his covenant with Abraham, and Abraham saw things that Israel would go through. I believe that one of those things that Israel would suffer or go through, the terrible things that were just horrible visions that Abraham had, was would be number one, one of those events would have been Israel's uh, going into Egypt and becoming slaves. But I certainly believe that this is the event that would have horrified Abraham as he would have looked at the future of his seed, the things that would be happening in the future. And so let's go back in chapter 12 and look at this introduction again to Israel. We did begin here last week, but we emphasized uh, that salvation or that uh, salvation was come, and we emphasized the blood of the Lamb last week. So in verse 1 of chapter 12, the Bible says, There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Last week we looked at Joseph, and we looked at how that he'd had the dream of the stars, and the stars worshiping or bowing down to his stars. We've seen many analogies in the scripture of Israel as being uh, as a star. We've looked at the star of David. This, These twelve stars are the twelve tribes of Israel. This is a representative. This is a picture of of Israel. We know that she was with child travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And we also know that that birth, that, that child which was delivered is Jesus Christ. Now, friend, as I said in the beginning, that birth of Jesus Christ is a past event. That's something that's already happened. But again, Israel has not been 
has not been in this act, if you will. I know it's not an act, but as John is seeing these scenes unfolding in heaven, Israel has not been involved with anything up to this point. We haven't seen Israel uh, in any kind of significant form. Again, we were introduced to the church and saw really uh, the letter to the churches, and then we saw the church gone. We've seen the tribulation period where, where God is dealing with the wicked and great judgment is happening. And now we're being introduced again to Israel. And to introduce us to Israel, it would help for those that have not been following along to find out who Israel is. Well, Israel is that one who had the covenant promise that she would bring forth the son, the Christ child. So she travailed in birth. And we see that the dragon did what he could to try to devour her child as soon as it was born. We see in verse 5, she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations. With a rod of iron, her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And this brings us back to uh, chapter 9 and verse 26 of Daniel. After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. And so the parallel passage to this would be Daniel chapter 9. And this would be a reference to the fact that Christ the Messiah would be cut off, but not for his sin, for the sin of the nations. And so caught up to heaven. Where is Jesus now? He's in heaven. He's in the throne room where God is. He's on the right hand of the throne of God the Father. And so Jesus is in heaven. And uh, so then we also see another past uh, statement. There was a war in heaven. Uh and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. Now let me ask you a question. Is the devil and his angels today in heaven? No, this is a past event. This is something that has happened in the past. And so we see for Israel that the Bible says in verse 6, The woman fled in the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Now, I don't want to get too much into this, but if you'll study Revelation 12, it helps you to easily understand anti-Semitism. In other words, a lot of anti-Semitic thought comes from stereotypical behavior. In other words, stereotypes of a people group, things about God's people, the Jews, that people don't like. And honestly, ethnically, there are things not to like about any cultural group of people, if you think about it. Right? White people, for instance. I don't like white people, to be honest with you. I'm just I'm joking, okay? Uh, but you could talk about white people and the things white people do and things white people say, and you could stereotype and you could talk about things white people do, and there would be some things you'd be right about talking about white people. You could talk about the Irish, you could talk about the Polish, you could talk about the Italians, you could talk about the Swedish. Uh, you could bring up any ethnic group of people, and there would be characteristics and behaviors of things that are not likable. Anytime I meet someone from another country, they tell me what they don't like about Americans. And while they're telling me, I'm sitting there thinking what I don't like about people from their country. You know, and so why, why, why would, why do you mention that, Pastor? Not because I'm, not because I'm talking about bigotry or anything like that. I want us to understand that people don't hate God's people, the Jews, because of Jewish stereotypes. They don't just hate the Jews because Jews band together in a group of people and exclude those around them because Jews are tight-fisted and take uh, advantage financially against people or because they're always trying to get a better deal uh, with someone. Those are oftentimes true stereotypes of Jewish people and also other people as well. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that you can't stereotype a people group because there's always, always, always multiple exceptions to it. Remember the stereotype uh, that Paul was discussing with Timothy about the church, or with Titus, I mean to say, about the Christians? I love that one. The Cretans are all liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Isn't that great, Mrs. Dolans? Don't just think about that all the time. I always think about those Cretans. And Paul said, he said, this witness is true. He said, in other words, people, they have a saying about themselves. And he said, the saying is true. And then he goes on to say, ordained ministers in every city there. In other words, whatever the stereotype is has nothing to do with what you can be if you are what you're supposed to be in Jesus Christ. I love that. 
a great truth. And if anybody is listening to what I'm saying and thinking, Pastor Price, you're somewhat of a bigot, I'm not. I'm less of a bigot than you are for thinking so. And that's a fact. The reality of it is, is that is that all of us have things because of our sin nature that aren't lovable, but because of Jesus Christ, we can be everything we ought to be. And it doesn't matter who you are and where you come from. That's a fact. So don't try and convince yourself or anyone else that people hate Jews because of ethnic stereotypes. People hate Jews, my friend, because of what God's going to do and because it is satanic. It is a satanic force against national Israel. In other words, this dragon trying to fight against Israel is not, you know, he's not avenging the wrongs that have been perpetrated against mankind by Israel. He hates God. And he knows God has a plan to use Israel, and so his trying to destroy the woman as she flees in the wilderness and is given eagle's wings to uh, be protected by, his motivation is that he hates God. My friend, the devil doesn't love you, and he doesn't love anyone that God loves. There's a big difference between the devil and God. You mark it down, you get it. Sin doesn't love you, the devil doesn't love you. Their aim and their, just, their, uh, their goal is to see you destroyed. And that's what the devil wants for, for, uh, for both Christ, what he wanted for Christ, and it's what he wanted for Israel. But look at verse 10. The Bible says, And I heard a voice, loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Verse 11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives under the death. And here we find in the half point of the tribulation period the conversion of national Israel. This is the fulfillment of Revelation chapter 11 when Paul says, and so all Israel shall be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. This is the time that these individuals overcome by the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ. And friend, this is perhaps for those that have studied and known Bible prophecy and have said, How long, O Lord? This is when they say it's <laughs> it's time, it's here. See, I'm always thrilled at Christmas time whenever I reflect on the reality that for thousands of years the desires of the nations had been that the one who would come who would redeem the world from sin. What an exciting event when Jesus Christ came to die for sin. Anybody in agreement with that? Yeah, we needed Jesus Christ to come. Every one who believed in God had believed God's promise that He would send a Messiah to save them from sin. And when Jesus came, my friend, it was the most exciting thing that ever happened. And that event is unparalleled. But can you imagine the excitement in heaven? Can you imagine the excitement on earth when the prophecies that God has had for Israel. We just we spent so many weeks before Christmas looking at Daniel 9 and looking at that final week that had to come before the temple, before the throne, or before Christ's reign, uh, the Messiah was established in the rebuilding of the temple. Uh, we looked at, at all the things that had to happen until this time. And I just want to tell you something. No man knows the day or the hour, but when, when these events take place here and Israel turns to God, we'll say... God's using Israel again. Can you imagine what a dark time this three and a half year period is when the church is taken up and there isn't really a witness on earth? The Holy Spirit is taken out of this world? And you have three and a half years of God judging defiant man. There's not a, there's not a place on earth of peace, of comfort, Listen, we can, we can uh, decry the lack of peace on earth today. We can talk about wars and rumors of wars and so on and so forth, which have always been. But the fact of the matter is, is that, my friend, tonight I most likely will go home and pillow my head in peace. Or I'll drive somewhere and get my teardrop camper and pillow my head in peace. But anyway, I'm going to sleep tonight. And I'll tell you the reason I'll be able to sleep this evening is because I haven't a care in the world as far as my future destination, my eternal destiny goes. In any event that could happen, I could find out bad news. Uh, by the end of the service this evening, I could find out bad news before I get home this evening, but I couldn't find out anything that would take away my peace. Amen. But 
there has been three and a half years on earth during this tribulation period when there has been war between God and man. I mean, God judging earth, sending all these seals, all these trumpet judgments and the woe judgments, and man shaking his fist at God and saying, I will not bow to you, God. And absolutely defiant against holy God in heaven. And I'll tell you something. Listen to me now. Any person who is in rebellion against God is without peace. You want to talk about a person who is in travail, who is in agony, who is in pain, who is the exact opposite of what God created them to be. It's a person who does not know Jesus as their Savior. It's been a rough time, but now we see in the Revelation chapter 12, we see that Israel, it's time when God's going to begin working with her. We've been introduced. Now we see in verse 10 the the exciting voice in heaven. That we, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God. Uh, news flash, this is not God's kingdom. Everybody know that? We're not all God's children and this isn't God's kingdom. Does it ever irk you a little bit when people say, well, we're all God's children. No, we're not all God's children. You become God's children through adoption. And you get adopted by receiving Jesus as your Savior. And then you are covered by the blood of the Lamb. And you have the position that Christ had as sons. As we saw in Romans 8 this morning, we are Christ is the firstborn among many brethren. But we are not brethren until we've received Jesus as our Savior. Okay, so what a wonderful thing it is when the heavens... The host in heaven is rejoicing and saying, Now is the kingdom come. I said a minute ago how exciting Christmas is to me when I reflect on the fact that, that for thousands of years men looked to the coming of Christ. And now for as many thousand years men have looked for this time of the coming kingdom of Christ. And this is an exciting time on earth that is coming. And so now God is preparing Israel so that He can rule and reign over them. So let's look at the events that happened with them. In verse uh, 13, the Bible says, When the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth... When was the dragon cast into the earth? Is this a future event or a past event? Yeah. Past. When the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Okay, again, I asked you the question, why is it that there is so much anti-Semitism in the world? I'll tell you why, because of the dragon. In other words, Israel doesn't have to turn to God. His kingdom doesn't have to begin for the Satan who is already here on earth, this event that has already happened, to persecute Israel. The devil hates Israel. Uh, somebody was asking me this morning, or we were, we were actually having a conversation about the wickedness in Jerusalem. I mentioned several weeks ago that Tel Aviv per capita has more Satan worshipers and more homosexuality than any other people group or place on earth. And somebody was going like this when I said that, and so they went and checked it out. And they said today, man, that's true, what you said about Israel. And their thought on it was, what a wicked people. Well, friend, the devil is after them. The dragon is after God's people, national Israel. And if you think the dragon can just go and slay whom he chooses, life and death is in the hand of the Lord. The devil doesn't have the, the ability to take life. Your life is in the hand. You think the devil is going to kill you. He's not going to you, my friend. God is the one who is the giver and the taker of, of breath and of life. And so understand and know then that the dragon's goal is to destroy people. What's the way to destroy people? Through sin. And uh, if there's ever a people group that are absolutely being destroyed by sin, it is that nation as a nation which has been against God and has, been, has succumbed to sin. So the Bible says in verse... Uh, 12, though. Well, verse 11, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. He's called the accuser in verse 10. Verse 13, the dragon saw that he was cast in the earth. He persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And then verse 14, we see that God, that God spares national Israel's life or so that he can use her. Verse 14, to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time 
We, we did this a couple weeks ago when we were looking at the seven-year tribulation period. But let's do the math here. Time, how many is that? One. Times, how many is that? Two. Two, Two plus one is how much? Three. What's half of one? Half. A half. So three and a half, half which is the half of the tribulation period. So here we see Israel turning to God, being persecuted by the dragon, and then we see God taking Israel to a place where she is kept for the half of the tribulation, the, the second half of the tribulation. And that's where we'll pick up next week. Let's close with prayer. Father, thank you so much for what we've seen this evening. I pray that you would help us with our understanding and help us to have hearts to understand. We thank you for what you do now in Jesus' name. You're dismissed. Thank you, Luke. <laughs> Welcome back, Luke. Pastor. Yes, ma'am. We didn't have any, did we have the verses at all? No. Can you at least try it? I I want it to count, but he can try it. Uh, who will run it, though? That's the question. We don't care. Devin will run it this week. Devin will run it. Devin will run it this week. Devin Scripture memory Devin. challenge by Devin. Okay, he said he'll run it. He said he'll run it if he can do it. Yeah, Devin. This week. This week, Devin will run. Okay. If anyone wants to do the scripture memory challenge, Devin will run. Give me your first. Okay. Is that it? Okay. All right, this one is Matthew 25 21. The Lord saith. The Lord saith unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful in a few things. I will make thee faithful in many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Okay. It was almost perfect. Uh, I'm going to say it uh, with you. You said, the Lord saith unto him. It's his Lord saith unto him. Lord. You know, you, and I know you knew that. So his Lord saith unto him, Thou hast been, or well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over, over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. I'm going to read it through and I'll let you say it again because I know you know it and you just had to listen to a message when you were ready to say it. So let's, we'll review. All right? Matthew 25, 21. His Lord saith unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Matthew 25-21 And it begins with His Lord. <laughs> his Lord saith unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee faithful over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Now you're really close. But is it, I will make thee faithful? I will make thee faithful. Uh, is that word faithful is the one I'm having trouble with. You've been faithful. I will make, I'll make thee, thee faithful over many things. I will make thee not faithful. Oh. I will make thee. I will make, I will make thee over many things. Yeah, almost. There's a. I will make thee. There's a word, and it's a. It's we use it for measuring. Um, it's not a yardstick, but it's a. Uh, I will make thee not a yardstick, but I will make thee. Ruler. Yeah, ruler over many things. Chuck got it perfect. I'll give it to you. <laughs> Anyone else? No? We'll hold off? Okay, we're going to hold off. You're dismissed. All right, good job, Chuck. I like that more. That was good. <laughs> I tried my best. That was very nice of you. As long as it's perfect, it's all right. Yeah. Doesn't matter how many times you try. <laughs>
There's nothing sick? about that in the rules. <laughs> you haven't been caught. Yeah, Not really sick. Y'all are dismissed if you want to be. <laughs> sit on right. This is too weird. Well, we probably shouldn't we touch these. Those we'll look stunned. Back. I give them to other people. So, I would like to see my